Hello everyone. This is a reading of Hidden Figures, the true story of four black women in the space race. This is by Margot Lee Shetterly and it's illustrated by Laura Friedman. Um, you may have seen the movie Hidden Figures and, and it was based on a book by um, a different book for grown-ups by Margot Lee Shetterly. And then she also decided afterward to write a, a a book for kids as well. So it's got wonderful illustrations. It's a really moving, inspiring story. And I'm really excited to share it with you today. Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden were good at math. Really good. In 1943, the United States was at war. World War II. Dorothy Vaughn wanted to serve her country by working for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the government agency that designed airplanes. Having the best airplanes would help America win the war. Making airplanes fly faster and higher and safer meant doing lots of tests at the agency's Langley Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia. Tests meant numbers. Numbers meant math and math meant computers. Today, we think of computers as machines, but in 1940, the 1940s, computers were actual people like Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine. Their job was to do math. Because Dorothy was black and a woman, some people thought it would be impossible for her to get a job as a computer. She lived in Virginia, a southern state where laws segregated or kept apart black people and white people. They could not eat in the same restaurants. They could not drink from the same fountains. They could not use the same restrooms. They could not attend the same schools. They could not play on the same sports teams. They could not sit near each other in movie theaters. They could not marry someone of a different race. But Dorothy didn't think it was impossible. She was good at math really good. She knew she was the right person for the job. She applied and the laboratory offered her a position as a computer. At work, blacks and whites were kept apart. The white computers worked in one building and Dorothy and the other black computers worked in a different building in their separate office. Even though they worked on the same kinds of, assi of assignments, the black computers and white computers used separate bathrooms and ate in separate lunch rooms. America won the war in 1945, but Dorothy stayed on the job, still trying to make airplanes faster and safer. By 1951, the Americans and the Russians were competing to see who could build the best planes. That meant more experiments and more numbers Lots and lots of numbers. And more numbers meant the need for more computers. That's when Mary Jackson got a job as a computer at Langley. She worked in a group that tested model airplanes in wind, in wind tunnels. A wind tunnel was a machine like a huge metal box with a powerful fan attached. Mary put model airplanes in the wind tunnel and blasted them with air from the fan this experiment helped her group improve their designs on the models before building full-sized airplanes. Mary wanted to become an engineer, but officials said it was impossible. Most of the engineers at the laboratory were men, and to become an engineer, Mary needed to take high-level math classes, but she wasn't allowed to go inside the white school where the classes were taught. But Mary was good at math, really good, and she refused to give up. She got permission to enter the school building and take the math classes, and she earned good grades. Because she didn't give up, Mary Jackson became the first African-American female engineer at the laboratory. Katherine Johnson was good at math and always asked lots of questions. In 1953, she applied 
I'm sorry. She applied to the laboratory for a computer job and was placed on a team that tested actual airplanes while, while they were flying in the air. Their research was used to figure out ways to prevent future plane crashes. In one of her first projects, she learned how to analyze turbulence or dangerous gusts of air. No one knows how many lives her work may have helped save. Catherine wanted to help the group prepare its research reports. So she asked if she could go to meetings with the other experts on her team. Her boss told her it was impossible. Women aren't allowed to attend meetings, he said, but Catherine knew she was as good at math as anyone else, maybe better. So she asked him again and again and again. Catherine asked her boss so many times that he finally invited her to the meetings. Catherine was good at math, really good. And because she fought to be treated the same as the men, she became the first woman in her group to sign her name to one of the group's reports. In the 1950s, the Langley Laboratory bought a machine computer that could do math faster than the human computers. And at first, these machines made mistakes. Dorothy learned how to program the machines so they got the right answers. She taught the women in her group how to program the computers too. In 1957, Russia launched a satellite known as Sputnik into orbit around the Earth. Uh, boys and girls, Sputnik was the first uh, man-made um, anything satellite that would that rotated around the Earth. The United States started building satellites to explore space too. For years, the laboratory had used math to design airplanes. Now it would need math to create spaceships as well. The government decided to change the agency's name from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy told Congress, I believe that this nation could, should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. A man on the moon but the first step in getting a man on the moon was to send an astronaut around the Earth. NASA was going to need to hire more space experts and more people who were good at math. Really good. The people at the laboratory had to work together from morning to night to figure out how to send astronaut John Glenn into space and bring him back home to Earth safely. Katherine Johnson knew she could use math to help. Tell me where you want this spaceship to land and I'll tell you where to launch it, Katherine told her boss. Katherine helped calculate tra the trajectories or pathways that rockets traveled through space. She had to plan on Glenn's exact route from takeoff in Florida to splash down in the Atlantic Ocean. There was no room for error. No one was better than Catherine at solving these tricky math problems. Days before his mission, John Glenn wanted Catherine to double check the machine computer's trajectory calculations to make sure it hadn't made any mistakes. When Catherine said the numbers were correct, Glenn was ready to go. And on February 20th, 1962, Glenn blasted off into space, circled the earth, and made his way home safely. Um, boys and girls, he was not the first American in space, but he was the first American to go around the earth. And he actually went around three times before he came back. And another little fact about John Glenn is he's also the oldest American to ever go into space. He went back into space in the 1990s when he was in his 70s, which is kind of exciting. Meanwhile, laws began to change so that black and white students could go to school together. Blacks fought for the right to sit be beside whites on buses 
and to think from, I'm sorry, to drink from the same water fountains. At the laboratory, black and white computers started working together in the same offices, eating the same lunch tables, eating at the same lunch tables, excuse me, and working the same bathrooms. I'm sorry, using the same bathrooms. My goodness. Black and white moviegoers could sit next to each other in the same theater. Across the country, people started to think about ways to bring equality to all Americans. Christine Darden was good at math, and she loved electronic computers. She started working at Langley in 1967. Christine wanted to become an engineer, and thanks to Mary, Dorothy, and Catherine, she knew it was possible. Eventually, she became an engineer for supersonic airplanes, planes flying faster than the speed of sound. But her first job was to help with NASA's mission to the moon. The people at the laboratory prepared for years to send astronauts to the moon. About 238,900, let me see, 238,900,000 miles away from Earth. Oh my goodness. Why is it so hard for me to say that number? So that's a big number. Finally, on July 20th, 1969, the world watched as the three men arrived at the moon in their Apollo 11 spacecraft. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, said astronaut Neil Armstrong when he stepped onto the dusty surface. But it was also a giant leap for Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, Christine, and all of the other computers and engineers who had worked at the laboratory over the years. The moon landing was a success from takeoff to splashdown, but there was no time to rest. Once NASA landed astronauts on the moon, the people at the laboratory began dreaming of sending humans to other planets, such as Mars or Jupiter or Saturn. They started to imagine hyper-fast space planes that could travel around the Earth at seven times the speed of sound. The next adventure wouldn't be easy, but would require lots of tests and more numbers. But Dorothy, Mary, Catherine, and Christine knew one thing. With hard work, perseverance, and a love of math, anything was possible. And here's a timeline, um, which is really well done. So, I mean, think about how amazing this is. In 1903, the Wright brothers made the first powered flight. And all the way to 1969, that's only 66 years between the first airplane flight and humans landing on the moon. I mean, that's quite amazing. Um, so in 1915, federal government establishes the National Advisory Committee for the Aeronautics. 1935, they started hiring women, female computers at Langley. 1943, Dorothy Vaughn started working for NACA where she stayed until 1971. And the first African-American female computers are hired at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. In 1951 was when Mary Jackson started working at NACA and she stayed there until 1985. In 1953, Katherine Johnson worked there until 1986. Um, and then a year later was the Supreme Court Brown versus Board of Education decision, the landmark Supreme Court decision that ruled it was unconstitutional to have separate schools for black and white students. And one of the things they said for that decision was separate is inherently unequal. If you keep people separate, it's going to be unequal. Um, 1958 was the national, the NASA is, is begins. A 19, I'm sorry, I skipped 1957 where the Soviets launched Sputnik. 1961, the Soviet cosmonaut, uh, it's basically an astronaut, Yuri Gagarin orbits the Earth. And then in 1962, American John Glenn did. 1967, Christine Darden started working at NASA. And she was there until 2007. Um, and then, of course, in 1969, Neil Armstrong 
Edward Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin, by the way, is still alive. Uh, they become the first humans to land on the moon. So from 1903, 1969, it's a lot of progress in the um, in airplane and space flight. Uh, let's meet the computers. So this is Dorothy Johnson Vaughn. She was she lived from 1910 to 2008. She was born on September 20th, 1910 in Kansas City, Missouri. She and her family moved to West Virginia when she was eight. Dorothy received a full scholarship to Wilberforce University, a historically black college in Ohio, where she graduated at age 19 with a degree in mathematics education. She married Howard Bond in 1932 and they had six children. After college, Dorothy worked as a high school math teacher in Farmville, Virginia. 1943, she began her job at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in Hampton, Virginia. She worked as a mathematician and computer, later becoming NASA's first African-American supervisor. When machine computers were introduced at Langley, Dorothy learned the programming language Fortran and taught it to her staff. She died in 2008 at the age of 98. Mary Winston Jackson, Jackson, Mary Winston Jackson, excuse me. She lived from 1921 to 2005. Mary was born April 9th, 1921 in Hampton, Virginia. She graduated with the highest honors from all black Phoenix High School, and then graduated from Hampton Institute in 1942 with degrees in mathematics and physical science. She taught math at an all-black high school in Maryland for a year before taking a job as a bookkeeper in her hometown. She married Levi, Levi Jackson Sr., and they had two children. Mary began work as a computer at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in 1951. She worked in a supersonic wind tunnel, studying the impact of wind forces that were nearly twice the speed of sound. In order to, to be promoted engineer, she needed to take graduate level class courses in physics and math. She had to petition the city of Hampton, Virginia for permission to attend classes because they were held at a whites only high school. She completed the classes and in 1958 became the first female African-American aerospace engineer at NASA. Late in her career, Mary took a position in NASA's Equal Opportunity Office, where she worked to support the careers of other women and minorities. She volunteered for more than 30 years as a Girl Scout leader, and she died in 2005 at the age of 83. Catherine Coleman Goebel Johnson. Uh, it says she was born in 1918 and is still alive, but actually I think she just passed away. I think she passed away in 19 or in 2019 at the age of 101. <laughs> Catherine was born August 26th, 1918 in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Her community did not offer public school for African Americans after eighth grade. So her family arranged for her to attend high, the high school run by West Virginia State Institute, 125 miles away. She completed high school at the age of 14 and went to West Virginia State College, graduating summa cum laude at the age, uh, it's basically with lots of honors, at the age 18 with degrees in mathematics and French. She, in 1939, she married her first husband, Jimmy Goble, and they had three children. Jimmy Goble died of a brain tumor in 1956, and then she married James Johnson in 1959. Catherine taught high school math before beginning work as a computer at Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory in, West, in Hampton, West Virginia in 1953. Her expertise in analytic geometry earned her a place in the flight research division. She worked on the flight trajectories, the flight paths for Project Mercury, the program that sent the first American astronauts into space. 
astronaut John Glenn specifically requested Catherine double check the computer's calculations of his spacecraft orbit around the Earth. She also contributed calculations to the 1969 Apollo 11 mission to the moon. And Dr. Christine Mann Darden, she was born in 1942 and still alive. Uh, She was born September 10th, 1942 in Monroe, North Carolina. She had an early understanding interest in understanding how things worked. And as a child, she repeatedly took apart and rebuilt her bicycle. She graduated high school valedictorian in 1958. She went to the Hampton Institute on a scholarship and graduated in 1962 with a degree in mathematics education. In 1963, she married Walter Darden Jr. She had two children and briefly taught high school math. She earned a master's degree in aerosol physics from Virginia State University. She earned her doctorate in mechanical engineering from Washington, George Washington University in 1973. In 1967, Christine Darden began to work at Langley. She became an expert on sonic booms, the sound associated with shock waves created when an or- object travels through the air faster than the speed of sound. She designed a computer program that could simulate sonic booms and help improve designs of aircraft flying at supersonic speeds. All right, so there's a glossary and an author note that I will let you read on your own. You can pause it if you want to read that real quick. And that is the end of our story. I hope you enjoyed it.